I'm on fire for the Lord, but I don't know how to discern the vocation that God may want me to do. Can you help me? For those of you uh, who don't know, I'm a recovering vocation director. <laughs> I, uh, I work for the past seven years as the vocation director for uh, the Diocese of Dallas. Uh, a couple of things that I like to say for guys who are discerning is, first and for foremost, um, you need to be praying every day. Um, you need to be allowing the Lord to direct your life and your heart to go out um, to love as uh, he has loved us. And the second thing is you, you do need to go out. Um, a lot of times we, when we say we're discerning, we're really just procrastinating. Um, we just sit back and we want God to take away every obstacle. Um, but that's never how the Lord moved. Um, it's Acts of the Apostles, right? Not sit back and wait for the Apostles. And you see this in Mark 16. This has been on my heart a lot recently. Um, in Mark 16, Jesus rebukes the Apostles for their lack of faith. And then he says, go out and preach. Right? And it is in the movement and the trust and taking a step in what the Lord has already revealed to us that he continues uh, his work within us. So pray every day. Um, don't procrastinate and like be immobile because of fear, but relate each step back to the Lord. Psalm 36 verse 9 says, in your light do we see light. Um, a lot of times we don't want to have to trust, um, but the Lord, give us this day our daily bread, says, I'm going to give you enough light for one step. Take it, and then you'll see the next one. So that would be... Um, that. And then finally, I hate when people say, oh, have you ever heard anyone say this? Um, oh, God will open up a door um, and then I'll walk through it or, or that door's closed. So I'm not going um, to go through it. I hate this open door, shut door kind of discernment. Uh, we have a God who kicks down doors. Um, yet you just see the tomb. Uh, you can imagine it. There is Jesus Christ is laid inside of it. He is dead. The, the door is rolled in front, and that is not the end of the story. And so um, if you feel that the Lord is calling you uh, to something and you are continually uh, hitting your head against some type of stumbling block, uh, you just keep going to the Lord and ask, is this what you want? And if he keeps placing on your heart to say yes, your only option is to trust that he's going to kick it down um, because we have a Lord that lives and the tomb is empty. Thank you, Father. My only thought would be when a young man thinks about the priesthood, I have always said to them, like, I went and spent time at a monastery, a Franciscan monastery of Marytown, and joined him, and it wasn't my vocation. Guess what? That formation was tremendous for me for the rest of my life. So usually men usually have a lot of excuses for not wanting to test the call, and I would be gentle but firm with a kick behind the rear and say, test your call, brother. You never know until you, you know, you got to go and do it. And um, that might be a little hard for them, but I have found in our culture, especially men and women, but men for vocations usually procrastinate forever. All right, thank you very much. Another question is, the role of fathers has been stressed a lot today. Can you provide some tips on how I can help my kids find hope in this troubled world. <laughs> that was good. Right back at me. Right back at me. Well, he's got kids too. I mean, you know. If, yeah, it's, um, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind, right, is like, okay, I never learned how to dance. I never, never went to a dance class. My family just danced like we just danced my my parents danced my my grandparents danced it was um you know sunday nights we called it the little house and it was just a back house and there was a jukebox or not a jukebox a record player or an eight track player and we just danced it's just i just danced um and i think like christianity in the home is like that you know, to, to foster hope, to foster faith, to, to foster trust, 
we have to hope. Like we have to be a, a people, a couple of hope and faith. And, and that's really, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than osmosis. I don't believe in just, you know, being passive about it. But I think if we intentionally have these conversations with our children at very young ages, right? Like, man, the world's going crazy, but man, I have hope because God's bigger than this and he's in charge and he's in control. Um, if, if, that's, if that's the words that they hear at the dinner table, they're gonna get it. They're gonna begin to understand that. But if they hear at the dinner table like, wow, this and that and everything's wrong and it's all going to hell and blah, 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 blah. And it's just, you know, and it's not our fault, but if that's kind of the mode we come into the family and we come into the, the dinner table at, um, you know, that's what, that's what they learn. Uh, to not hope in God. And then the other thing I would say just really briefly is just eat together. Just eat together. And, and I know that that's really hard today, and we're busy men, and there's, you know, baseball and soccer and track and swimming and dance, and there's all these things going on extracurricular outside of the home that we feel like we have to do. Maybe it's time for some boundaries. Maybe it's time, if, 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 if you feel like you're too busy to eat with your family every night, um, but yet you're saying like, man, why are my kids going off and doing crazy things? Like, maybe it's simpler than you've made it. Um, maybe because you thought this is the way I love them by getting them into all these different activities, you've really hindered um, their faith life because they just haven't been sitting down for a meal with you at the end of the day. All right, that's all right. Is that it? Okay, thank you. All right, next one. Marriage is a blessing, but it's tough at times. How do I convey what I've experienced today to my wife? Oh, you didn't hear that. How do, how do I, how do, how, he wants to know how do you convey the things that have, he's experienced and learned today to his wife. How does he oh, okay. how do you communicate it to yeah. me and also be a better husband? Well, what I, would, what I would say on communicating what you've learned today is your wife's going to love to hear you say, honey, uh, I learned that as Jesus died on the cross um, and suffered for all of our sins and that he's willing to do that, that I learned that my, uh, our marriage, that my salvation is tied into serving you. And I'm willing to die like Jesus did on the cross because I married you and that's my commitment to you. She might like to hear that. It would melt her heart, right? Look, our marriage is like a cross. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. But it's true, right? Like the idea that I am Christ and she is the church, right? And yeah, I think, I think that's it. Um, I, again, I would just say, um, like she'll know by the way you serve. I mean, the best way you can communicate what you are taking home today is by real, measurable action. You got them, it's gotta be measurable. Man, you came home and you just all of a sudden are more aware of my needs. Boy, that will go a long way and she'll definitely send you back. <laughs> what you just said, for example, I get my wife, I'm an early riser, not unlike father, he's the morning. I uh, go to bed early, but I get up early. My wife wakes up, she knows, not coffee, she wants a glass of water. For 35 years, I've been getting her that glass of water. That's measurable. So I just say, maybe there's something your wife's waiting for you to do every day, and you thought, gee, it's kind of, it's kind of mundane. But you know what? When I do that to her, periodically I will say, honey, Mary Danielle, I do this because I love you, and I hope you um, accept this as an expression of my love for you today. So it's a simple thing. So what is that thing that you need to do for your wife when you go back every single day? Think about that one. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, Jim just told me I'll, I'll have one more question here in a moment, but uh, maybe two, but uh, some people have said today that at various places in the church, it's been hard to hear everything that's been said. And if that has been the case for you and you would like to hear these talks or the conference, it's gonna be posted online within about a week, catholicbrothersforchrist.com. Okay, so catholicbrothersforchrist.com. All right, another question has to do with sacred scripture. There's been a lot of mention about sacred scripture, but can you all stress a little bit more about how to get the most out of studying and uh, meditating on sacred scripture? I would say first and foremost, um, to not approach the scriptures as a thing to study, but as a, an ability to be able to have a relationship with the Lord. Um, that is probably one of the best things um, that came out of Dei Verbum from Vatican II. Um, previously, we would um, go to the scriptures mining it for data. Oh, Jesus is from Nazareth. He lives in Capernaum. He died at the age 33. Um, but really, Hebrews 4 says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, capable of piercing us to the very depths of who we are. Um, and so to expect that when we open our scriptures that the Lord is going to speak to us because it's the word of God. And I, I always just think about this. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge uh, reader of fiction books, um, and I love them, and I use this... Uh, Example, did anyone ever read the book, The Martian, right? You might have seen the movie, but it, if you read the book, you feel like you know the astronaut Mark Watney. Uh, and like I, by the end of that book, I felt like he was my friend. I felt like I had been to Mars. I felt like I had been um, in his dwelling place and stuck in that rover and going all across. I, this might be a surprise, but I've never been to Mars. But like, I feel like I have. Um, and I feel like Mark Watney is a friend of mine, so much so that when I ended the book, I started it again. That is a natural human author writing the natural human word that was able to introduce me to someone that was not real uh, and take me to a place that I have never been. How much more can a divine author and an inspired uh, author introduce me to the actual living person of Jesus Christ? And how much more can it actually help me to become a friend with him when I approach it knowing that it has that power? And so uh, I wouldn't try to memorize scripture. I wouldn't try to study scripture. I would read and encounter the Lord in scripture. And then all of a sudden, as you experience the Lord, like there are defining memories in your life like when you met your spouse, when your first child was born, you remember those moments and you can recount them to people. And when things are going that are difficult, those, mem those memories come up. What's gonna happen when you encounter Jesus in the scripture, when you've placed yourself in the midst of them and you go to them with that power, when things are difficult, you're gonna, like Peter walking on water is going to come to mind. And you're gonna, but it's gonna be like you walking on water and whatever that metaphorical wind and wave is, right? And you start to sink and you feel like you're drowning, you're gonna be able to call out, Jesus, save me. And that's how scripture is powerful. Don't study it, don't memorize it. Well, I mean, do study it, do memorize it, but not primarily. That attitude, uh, I think, is what brings out the best. I have one thing to say. Actually, I do love the historical context quite a bit. I mean, very quick. I mean, if you really want to, if you want to know scripture, you just have to do, like, you just have to read. So really don't even, I mean, you know, everybody is going to have a different, here, do this, do that, do, you know, and I, I was, uh, I was privileged, honored, blessed to be, to, to study under Dr. Scott Hahn. And he would just say, it doesn't matter what translation, it doesn't matter how you do it, just do it. Just do it. Just read. And, um, I, I really love history. I really love Texas history, but the Deutero historical books are legit crazy. Have you, I mean, you read Kings, you read these things, even, you know, even, um, you know, e even the, um, 
you know, the Pentateuch, you're going to find uh, things like that, that, that touch you in a new way every time you encounter them again, right? Like the sacrifice of Isaac, you know, like Abraham, like, oh my gosh, that's so powerful. Like how in the world could a, could a father ever trust God enough to put his son on a thing? And then, but if you read the whole book, you're like, whoa, that's not the first time he asked, you know, for a major sacrifice. Right before then, he asked him to cut off a little bit of his penis. Sorry. <laughs> but I mean, that's crazier. I'm sorry, man. Like, I, that's insane, right? He was like, okay, we're going to do what? Uh, just a little bit. Just a little bit of it. So you realize, you realize, like, I'm sorry for those on the live stream, like, you realize for a minute that, like, this is not the first time that Abraham has been trusting God, that it's been a long period of time where he's trusted God in many, many ways that led up to the sacrifice of Isaac or not, right? So, 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 even, so if you're a historical person and you just like to see kind of the history of things, I'd recommend going back and reading some of those things as well. And then, like I said earlier, John's gospel is just a great... Oh, it's just so poetic. It's, there's, it's Hellenism. It's, it's the Logos. It's, you know, if you like Plato, read John. Um, you know, so anyway, all the way to say, just start reading. Got you got something, yeah. Not other than, since they were formed by Scott Hahn, I recorded those classes. They're available with that little scan. You like <laughs> my punt in there? Well played, well played. I, I right, also thank you so much. I want to say this, like, um, Han has a good friend, Dr. John Bergsma, who also taught at Franciscan, and he has a great book. If you want the historical context in a way to, like, really kind of break down even more so than Han's Father Keeps His Promises, uh, Biblical Basics for Catholics by John Bergsma. It really teaches you not only how to break it down, but actually how to whiteboard it and teach it to others. So um, I found that to be a super effective book. All right, thank you very much to all three of you. Really appreciate it very much. And